It's a wild week in politics. What does Rick Santorum's clean sweep on Tuesday night really mean? Is he now Mitt Romney's main challenger? Is Mitt Romney even still the favorite? Answers to those questions and to your questions on today's edition of the Video Crystal Ball. We here at the Crystal Ball know of no one who predicted that Santorum would beat Romney in all three states. There were many people who believed that Santorum would defeat Romney in Minnesota. There were many who also thought that Santorum could win that no delegate contest, beauty contest in Missouri. Uh, we know of no one who thought that Santorum would actually defeat Romney in Colorado. After all, Romney got 60% of the vote in Colorado just four years ago. Uh, that was the biggest surprise of the night. The message, obviously, is not just pro-Santorum. It's more anti-Romney. It's that conservative base having buyer's remorse, having second thoughts about Mitt Romney, just as he was being installed by the punditocracy as the potential or likely Republican nominee. And they're saying, slow down, let's think about this thing again. Let's think about it some more. Is he conservative enough? We don't trust him. There were lots of messages there for Mitt Romney, probably more for Romney than for Santorum or any other of the candidates. Just to keep this in perspective, let's remember that when you add up all of Rick Santorum's votes in Colorado, in Missouri, in Minnesota, the three states he won on Tuesday night, he actually got fewer votes in those three states than he got in the state of Florida, where of course he got a small percentage of the vote and finished uh, well behind both Mitt Romney and Newt Gingrich. Uh, speaking of Newt Gingrich, he has to be the unhappiest person this morning other than Mitt Romney because Rick Santorum probably became Mitt Romney's primary opponent, at least in the media mind and the public mind. Uh, going forward, we'll be hearing more about Rick Santorum, less about Newt Gingrich, unless Gingrich can somehow find a way to win again outside the Deep South. Mitt Romney can't change his persona and he can't change his record. But what he can do is determine his level, level of spending. The mistake that Mitt Romney made in the three states on Tuesday night was to assume that he could skate after his big victories in Florida and Nevada, that somehow he was becoming accepted by the party base as the eventual nominee. Big mistake. Uh, he spent very little. His super PAC spent very little. And we've seen whenever the resources end up being equalized, the conservative base comes roaring back and says no to Mitt Romney. So it's now clear that Romney is going to have to flood any state he wants to win with negative ads aimed at the opponent who has popped up in the whack-a-mole contest, who's become his major opponent. Right now, Santorum, previously Newt Gingrich, who can say who it'll be in the future. It's going to take a lot of spending. I guess in a sense, he'll, he'll have to brainwash each of these states' Republican electorates. Another connection between Mitt and his father, George. If you look historically, Often, these races become marathons. You don't have a knockout punch in the first few primaries. And it's now clear that 2012 on the Republican side is going to be a marathon. Uh, Romney is going to have to slog through a lot of states and a lot of primaries and caucuses before not only he can get to 1,144 delegates, but before he can really convince the Republican base that uh, it's him or chaos it's him or Obama. So uh, this is not going to be easy for Romney, but there's no other way. Uh, if he were going to study one of the historical examples, he probably should choose a Democrat. He should choose 1992. He should choose Bill Clinton. There's a case of a candidate who was off to a very weak start, who was only reluctantly accepted by his party's base as the nominee, they wished that there were 14 other candidates in the race. They wanted somebody else to be the nominee. But Clinton kept at it. He used every day well. He was persistent. He never gave up. He made his arguments well with relatively few gaffes, day after day, week after week. 
And of course, by the end of that primary campaign, he was in a position to take advantage of the events as they occurred, including the Perot candidacy, non-candidacy, and recandidacy. Uh, there, there won't necessarily be a Perot in 2012, uh, but Romney can learn some valuable lessons from Bill Clinton. Uh, Bill Clinton did not have the presidency handed to him. It wasn't easy for Clinton. And whether Mitt Romney wants to accept it or not, it isn't going to be easy for him either. Now let's take a look at the map to see what's coming up and how this race might shape up from here on out. The next two contests are not until February 28th, Arizona and Michigan. And each of the candidates has to decide where he wants to concentrate his resources. Obviously, for Mitt Romney, he has to do both. He'll probably have to spend more in Arizona than Michigan, although it's possible that Rick Santorum will choose to make a stand in Michigan rather than Arizona. Gingrich will probably choose Arizona rather than Michigan, assuming he plays, and Ron Paul is going to do what Ron Paul always does, which is get a certain number of delegates. But that's going to be interesting. We'll see whether Romney can come through and win two states that he was supposed to win. He certainly didn't win Colorado, which he was supposed to win. Then we go from there to another caucus state, Washington state, where Ron Paul is going to be strong again where Rick Santorum potentially could be strong. Those are very conservative activists who turn up on the Republican side for those caucuses. That's right before Super Tuesday, which as we've stressed before, is not nearly as super as it was four years ago. But in Super Tuesday, there's one state above all that really matters, and that's Ohio. That's where Newt Gingrich has already gone, and he's correct to have gone there. He'll do well in some of the Deep South states and the border states that are on the ballot uh, both on Super Tuesday and the week following Super Tuesday. But Gingrich has got to prove he can beat Romney in a state like Ohio if he's going to come back. But now, of course, Santorum will be playing in Ohio too. Romney will have to play big in Ohio. So Ohio becomes the super swing state of Super Tuesday. By the way, as a native Virginian, it could have been Virginia too. That's the other super swing state voting on Super Tuesday. But of course, we don't have a super ballot. We have more of a Stalinist ballot with only two candidates having qualified, Mitt Romney and Ron Paul. And Mitt Romney will win that contest very, very easily, uh, picking up the vast majority of delegates. So that's the near term. Again, it's going to be a marathon. I don't think anybody believes that this is going to wrap up on Super Tuesday or the week after Super Tuesday or the month in which Super Tuesday is held. Uh, we're looking at a long contest. Uh, it's great for pundits. It's great for the press. It's great for you if you love politics. It's only hard and tough on the candidates. And now let's go to some of your questions sent to us over Twitter. Our first question this week comes from Matt Durant and he asks, does Mitt Romney's religion hinder or help his campaign? Well, Matt, of course, it's always a mixture. It's both. But I have to say, the Mormon population is much smaller than most people think. It's only about 2% of the voters. Yes, they're concentrated in a certain number of states where it can help Romney potentially, both in the primaries and the general. Utah and Nevada and Arizona, Wyoming, Idaho. Uh, including parts now of Colorado. Uh, having said that, uh, this is very different than John F. Kennedy's situation in 1960. Uh, Catholics were close to a quarter of the voters in 1960. That was a tremendous boost for Kennedy's campaign in many, many states. 2% uh, of the voters isn't nearly that much of a boost. And we all know, even though it's wrong, religious prejudice is out there. It's directed at Mormons. It's concentrated in the fundamentalist community. They have real questions about Mormonism, and it's going to hurt Romney in some places. He'll still be able to carry most of the southern states and the border states, uh, but there may be the occasional swing state where that doubt about Mormonism will cost him a close election. All right, our next question is as follows. Will Joe Biden re-up as vice president in 2012? He seems the invisible man and not at all impactful on the Obama presidency. Well, what he does may be as much private as public, and 
President Obama is the best judge of whether he's contributing constructively to the administration, and President Obama has already decided that Joe Biden will be on the ticket. Any speculation you see to the contrary is false. We're also in a completely different era than the one that existed for, say, Franklin Roosevelt, who had three vice presidents. I don't think we'll ever have a situation again where it will be easy for a president to drop his or her vice president for re-election without causing a stir unless there's a health problem uh, on the part of the vice president. How are all these incumbents not seeking re-election in the House affecting who will be in the next majority? Well, that's an interesting question and in fact our crystal balls Kyle Condit has looked into this question and written a very good piece in this Thursday's Crystal Ball. There are 41 House incumbents who are not running for re-election, running for some other office, just retiring, whatever. Uh, the very interesting thing that Kyle finds out is that it's having minimal impact on the makeup of the next House of Representatives. There may be the tiniest advantage for the Republicans uh, in the incumbent retirements that he analyzes, but in most cases, uh, the seats are already clearly classified as Democrat or Republican. There really doesn't seem to be much of a shift on account of retirements. There will be plenty of shifts for other reasons. Any truth to Senator Warner quitting and running for the Virginia governorship in 2013? If Senator Warner wins, he could appoint his own replacement, right? Well, this rumor has been around for quite some time and it's intensified recently. And believe it or not, there does appear to be some substance to it. I don't think Senator Warner has made a final decision about running for governor, but he seems to be somewhat interested. Part of it is he's frustrated with the U.S. Senate what sane person wouldn't be. And he's also looking at the office he enjoyed a great deal, the governorship, uh, which is a much better office from which to run for president, an executive office to an executive office, barring what happened in 2008 with two senators running for president. So uh, I think it's a possibility. I don't think anyone would call it a probability right now. Uh, the bonus is that uh, if Senator Warner ran and won the governorship, Yes, he would get to appoint his own successor. Uh, this has been uh, tested out in a number of other states. The outgoing governor does not get to appoint the successor because uh, the incoming governor resigns the Senate seat at the moment he takes the oath of office and he gets to appoint the new senator. So it's not a bad deal. Not a bad deal at all if Senator Warner decides to go for it. Well, that's all for this week in the Video Crystal Ball. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, keep up with politics by keeping up with the Crystal Ball. Politics is not just a good thing. As this year is proving, it's also a chaotic thing. So follow us as we follow the world of politics, the thrill of victory, and the agony of defeat.